Next up we have Jillian Post. Again, she's the Global Peacemaker Fellow at Claremont Lincoln University, Central New Jersey. Good afternoon. I wanted to take a second to um, acknowledge that I worked with Basel and his organization before uh, when they were actively doing the Living Together movement. And um, since I transitioned from one industry to the other and one part of the country to the other, I've been embedding myself and going to many conferences and symposiums and et cetera, et cetera. It, it all led to a job which is what it was supposed to do. And, you know, sometimes you get into big, big, big conferences and things like that, and the art is meaningful as the small but mighty group that's here today. So I just want to acknowledge that, that it's very, it's very international, it's, it's deeply engaging, it's extremely informative and intelligent. So thank you for that. So, uh, Basil, if you go to the next slide, that little square there, I just wanted to read it for you in case you couldn't. Become friends with people who aren't your age. Hang out with people who, whose first language isn't the same as yours. Get to know someone who doesn't come from your social class. This is how you see the world, this is how you grow. So the question beneath that is, who is your other? Because this paper, this presentation, um, talks a lot about otherizing. It's basically, the, the whole presentation today is about a project that I created for an interfaith action program. And I want to clarify that the program is done, I've got my master's, um, and I'm working someplace else, but it's associated with this fellowship, so. I designed this uh, online interfaith project as part of this master's program in interfaith action. It's, it was my second master's program. The first one was in conflict resolution, so there was a lot of overlap. The work was envisioned to be multi-ethnic, multi-religious. It was a participatory action research project, PAR. Um, specifically asked by my by the program to be action oriented. So I wanted to explore human intersectionality, complex religious identities, and the possibility of how our faith and philosophically influenced stories may affect treatment of those whom we consider to be the other, or people outside of our familiar group. I created my own group. Um, I was asked to work with an organization, but after many struggles, I actually created my own group by reaching out through listservs that included folks who were interested in interfaith relations and facilitated dialogue. So we started with a group of 10, which is a quite workable number, um, and created a richly diverse representation, and I was thrilled. But one by one, participants, from some from across the ocean, missed multiple prep sessions due to work scheduling, conflicts, and a challenging time zone combination. So when we settled into community, we, were, we had a solid group of seven, all from the US, but very different backgrounds. Not wanting to discount the reality that each of our stories, no matter how similar they look on the outside, is multifaceted and rich with history, we just embraced our small group and we got to work. So I'm gonna present the details of this project that I entitled Mitigating Ethno-Religious Bias through interfaith dialogue and encounter journaling. Um, <clears throat> a little bit about the values and the scope of the project. So the purpose of this project was to recognize and mit mitigate long-held biases felt toward ethno-religiously diverse others. Uh, by communicating and exploring both positive and negative stories from their past, we as participants were able to lay the groundwork for uncovering latent meanings that might correspond to adult behavior. In the end, the group hoped to break down barriers between themselves and those thought of as the other. We wanted to mindfully deepen the level of engagement with those typically avoided, or thought of as in potentially negative ways. So officially, the research statement for this project reads, because our shareholder group values inclusivity, we want to explore the impact of our childhood philosophical and religious influences so that we can mitigate biases we bring with us and lessen our otherizing behaviors. Quite a mouthful, and that's shortened. An invitation to join the project was posted on international listservs, and the final group consisted of seven participants from Catholic, Atheist, Lutheran, Jewish, Mormon, Unitarian, Universalist, and Humanist traditions. So the initial step was to gather a signed consent form um, that's on three, slides three through seven. 
you can go through those. It's a stand, it was a standard consent form, but I just wanted to acknowledge that that was part of what was being requested of us and what is being requ what's requested of anybody that participates in this kind of uh, project. Uh, the next, the groups were uh, the group of, of participants filled out a survey, which is on slide eight. The project was facilitated using the pro version of an online platform called Zoom, which many of you are probably familiar with. It gives us um, really useful features like screen sharing and a whiteboard, a whiteboard which <laughs> we try to use once in a while. And, and um, you know, online work is is, a, is has a learning curve, so. The, the dialogue was also recorded with permission, and then I summarized each of these sessions and, and sent them out to participants a few days later. So it began with an intake session uh, conducted in June 2016 and was followed by eight subsequent sessions. And then over the holiday break in 2016, participants were asked to engage in three separate encounters with those who felt very ethnically and religiously different from themselves so much so that they felt discomfort due to certain biases, and then record what happened. The parameters of these encounter journals were clearly delimited to the participants. Early in 2017, two final sessions were facilitated during which time participants shared sections of those journals that they thought were particularly interesting or poignant. They, they weren't forced to share, they could share whatever they wanted. The survey was retaken by all participants at the end of the project. So the before and after answers in the journals were analyzed for their changes in bias awareness, level of engagement with those not comfortably approached, and changes in behavior and language about the topic. Um, some of the, a little bit about the values that matter to us. So the values that guided this project included a desire to be inclusive of all people, regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, or philosophical belief system. Beyond that, we wanted deeper engagement and actionable results uh, where we faced our biases head on. We also talked and tried to set up in the early stages um, values for the dialogical process itself. So we had a long, long list and we actually took two 90 minute sessions just to develop just to develop these values and talk about them and explore them. Uh, a few of them include cohesion, uncensored communication, cherishing differences, bias awareness, recognition of white privilege and societal power imbalances, respect, safety, compassion, collaborative spirit, objectivity, empathy, and non-judgment. The dialogue was structured into two different modes we call D mode for discussion and C mode for circle. So when we were in D mode, um, we raised our hands and we went in the order, kind of like popcorn. But when we were in C mode, we stayed in what we refer to as a sacred circle. So we went in a specified order and we used a talking piece, even with the webcam. Um, no interruptions allowed, each person talked and so they were done and then they would hold their talking piece up to the, the video, the cam, the webcam and say, I'm finished. And this, this work, um, if anybody studied, studied the work of Kate Pranis, it's kind of based on that. So some of our participants had very conservative viewpoints on same-sex marriage and abortion. Some didn't believe in God in a monotheistic way, and they, especially toward the end when we built our comfort level, um, they expressed this freely. Group participants used explicit language and direct quotes when sharing stories in order to convey the powerful impact of the biases held over from the past. We began particularly to realize how critical our work was together when we weathered the November 2016 US election and the public rhetoric leading up to it, which we all know was immense, immensely divisive. We recognize that if effective dialogue can't be mastered and stereotypes and biases undone, our societies may decline into deeper hatred. The work is relevant to the health and well-being of not only American people, of course, but transnationally, because hate crimes against Muslims in the U.S. increased by 67% in 2015. This is merely one statistic that justifies the important work for the future. It's also worthy to note the implication of this, that the work, work may have on international relations with nations that prior U.S. administrations have referred to as the axis of evil, 
in my opinion, um, a very derogatory term and one that set the course for a while, maybe influencing still today. Healthy engagement is crucial in areas where the U.S. is increasingly being thought of in negative terms, and it starts with one conversation at a time. So, of course, we faced some challenges uh, because of the random and virtual nature of this project and because we gathered as strangers, it took a while to build the cohesion. Um, we also faced internet reliability at times. And we also, because of a video cam setting, we couldn't see the full nature of each other's body language, which is crucial to, to effective communication, of course. Um, but despite those things, we, we took them, you know, under advisement and uh, forged ahead. So we defined some terms together, uh, the, and I'll define them for you today as we saw them. The encounter journals are the written logs they constructed over that two-month period toward, toward the end of the project. The guidelines for these journals can be found on slide nine. Slide nine. There should be number nine. Yeah. Um, they arranged three quasi-intentional encounters of their choosing. In addition, the group defined the term the other as those ethnically or religiously diverse uh, people that would, they would not typically engage with due to fear or dread or lack of knowledge. Lastly, we interpreted a sacred or talking circle as one where participants engaged in uninter uninterrupted um, dialogue until all were finished. And so there's a visual representation of that on, page, on slide 10. <coughs> slide 10. There you go. So it's just a couple things I put together. It's, again, the work of Kay Pranis, and um, there's some awesome videos of her presenting and, and talking about her work, if you are interested in more um, of how that's structured. So a short synopsis of the research that I did before this project ensued. I talk about how, you know, we wondered aloud, can dialogue change bias and eventually behavior? If we root through our, our familiar traditions, role model to us by caregivers, you know, what are we gonna find? Some of them were called rituals that, that meant nothing during childhood, but then provided insight as we began to talk about them. Others um, cleaved their teachings as a basis for how they think and engage with diverse others even today. And finally, some strayed away from the teachings modeled to them as a, as a way to correct for what they consider errant ways. So the hypothesis of this project was that latent effects of one's upbringing sometimes cause individuals to behave in certain ways relevant to the tapes they create in their minds during childhood. Most often these biases go unidentified and are certainly not something we take action upon. By dialogue together in a safe space with commitment and courage, the participants developed a new awareness for encounters that might otherwise produce trepidation or dread or fear, or at the very least, disinterest. So some of the perspectives, perspectives found in the research, um, uh, my search terms include transmission of family values, changing behavior, the other, uh, benefits of journalizing and reflective practice, bias awareness. So evidence exists that we carry the keys to unlocking our, where our biases originate, and that a reflective practice, such as journaling, can help us move past these long-held memories and biases that grow out of them. Such tools help us to examine these memory tapes we carry with us through the lifespan. Kathleen Love states it this way, the untested mental models that we carry in our heads often come from people we love the most, our teachers, religious educators, mentors. It's up to us to examine our own assumptions and decide if we want to keep or change these mental models. And it also requires that we go out of our zone of comfort. So the three most important findings culminating out of this research include Copen and Silverstein's clear analysis of the mechanisms that are used to transmit values from parents to children, socialization through direct training instruction, role modeling, and studying social, and one might relig wonder religious, texts that predispose them to certain values and worldviews. Additionally, with regard to bias awareness, 
Pope, Price, and Wolfers recommend um, exposure to situations that contradict the particular biases that are causing the problem in the first place. The dialogue group intentionally placed themselves where they could have encounters with their version of the other, and then through introspection, they searched for valuable insight. Pope et al. also suggests that public awareness can reduce bias, which is why our experiences, we conducted them in plain view, so at the bus stop, on the train, in line to buy concert tickets. Participants were asked to, with finding ways to overcome these biases we carry with us into adulthood. And finally, P. Wordy points out that a reflective practice such as journaling helps people consider the intersectionality between privilege, oppression, diversity, and how these facets shape our experiences. He further suggests that journal writing can serve as a sounding board that elicits self-disclosure, self-exploration, and self-discovery. So a little bit about the demographics. Uh, we were six females, one male, all Caucasian, with, from, very, from various traditions. They came from, the participants came from Seattle, Minneapolis, Atlanta, New York, New Jersey, and one of them served as a mentor in the project. She had a lot of experience with restorative justice, interfaith dialogue, um, mediation, and basically she, she helped me as the facilitator. I was the facilitator, but it was a participatory event, of course, um, but she helped me slow down and take those full 90 minutes to discover and explore our values because I was, I was trying to get to, my, my school was trying to urge me to look for the change, look for the change, and we had to slow down and take the, the full time. So um, this helped us kind of create this sacred story sharing space. So a lot of them had awareness of, of biases and not so hidden biases. Uh, many of them had uh, background in interfaith dialogue, but they still recognized the influences of their childhood interactions. They courageously, really, shared these stories um, that included watching parents exhibit racist and religiously biased behavior. And then we dis dissected these influences and, um, of how and how they got into our adult thinking. One of our participants suggested the idea of encounter journals. So I didn't even think of that. One of the participants did. And because it was designed to be a participatory action project, um, it sounded great, and we went with it. So we decided to kind of explore what some examples of that might look like. Um, like, for instance, the Hasidic Jew walking down the sidewalk, the woman on the train wearing a burqa, or the store owner discussing his atheism in plain view. I mean, these are stark examples. But ultimately, if, we're, if we are honest with ourselves, and that's what we were requiring of each other, uh, we are challenged in our full acceptance of the other. The research supports the human tendency that we are influenced by our caregivers' religious and philosophical teachings. We become aware of these biases when we share our stories. So as shareholders, we became live change agents, if you will, going into our communities and engaging with those whom we would generally consider off limits. We pushed through our discomfort and critically analyzed and then changed our interactions from closed to open, from safe to vulnerable. It was, it was difficult work, but we rose to the challenge. So just to recap some of the methods, there were eight sessions over nine months in an online platform. Uh, slide 11 shows the timeline. It was 15 months total by the time I started, uh, from the time I started to the time I ended. Shareholders provided opening and closing reflections and the ideas for the encounter journals. Guidelines, shown on slide nine, were given, um, making the comparative analysis a little bit easier. The encounters were included conversation, but also intra-personal intra dialogue. Both required introspection and mindful awareness. The group shared their journals in our last full dialogue session held in late January 2017. Interestingly, hardly a person missed a session. We had a little bit of trouble at the end, but we, we built such a deep level of cohesiveness that um, they wanted to be there. So our final session was held in early February as a way to go closure to the shareholders. And then we actually met again this summer, just because we wanted to, just to share recent musings and thoughts about the state of the world. So measurement began with an and began and ended with a survey. 
The first five questions were open-ended and the last question was a rating scale with 10 parts. Um, the options for answering were placed on a continuing, ranging from I strongly, dis I strongly agree to I strongly disagree with five components in between. Taking the survey as, a, as the project commenced and again as it ended, served as a rudimentary measurement tool, but one that ultimately produced noticeable changes. The written journals and survey answers were then compared and analyzed, the results of which are shown in appendices F and G, slides 12 through 20. You can see I took it and I color-coded all the answers. We can't read them. I don't want you to read them, actually. But these are all of the things. And then we, I broke that down further. You can stop right there for a second. Also, we'll get to that in just a second. Okay, so making sense of this project, our shareholder group was unclear exactly what to measure. Um, we had a hard time deciding what it would be. We, um, the survey answers in the encounter journal was, uh, and contained very rich narrative on stereotypes and bias awareness. So key words were identified to help with this analysis. Researcher and psychologist Saul McLeod reminds us that there is clear disadvantage to stereotyping because it makes us ignore differences between individuals. Individuals, therefore, we think things think things about people that might not be true. So the participants in this project clearly wrestled with what is and what is not true about how we see the differences between us. So narrative data is particularly challenging to interpret without a complex coding system. A good example of this work is by social psychologist Raina Neufeld, and that where her work kind of served as um, the inspiration, I guess. I, I don't want to share a lot of this narrative, but I'll share, I'll share one piece from Participant G. They write, uh, learning to change and overcome ethno-religious bias is a lifelong process, one that some never embark upon. They never face the shadowy demons from their past. They just incorporate them into their present and future. So this project, as the person writes, was about exploring those demons and trying to move past them in a marked way. So when interfaith dialogue cha creates change in the responses to a set of questions, does this statistically, does this rec or, uh, represent statistically significant data? Perhaps no, but that was not our goal. Um, the United States Pizza Institute points out that despite the increasing popularity of interfaith dialogue, rarely are these dialogue projects suggested to rigorous events, or rigorous efforts to evaluate their impact and effectiveness. And our project was no exception. But we sought to carve out space for increased awareness and mindfulness. So the most productive evaluation of what did or did not change is represented by um, slides 15 through 20. And what I did was I just took all of the answers, um, there's some narrative components, and then I put them all on, on uh, uh, tables, and you notice I say appears to, or seems to, because I can't possibly know what was inside their minds, but based on their answers, we moved, we moved, we moved the chart. So one of the most interesting reflections we discussed several times throughout the dialogue sessions um, were, were, were memories. Um, distant memories about religious rituals. And for some of them, they, they found a new found appreciation for them. And some of them viewed them, deemed them as harmful, and so they wanted to let them go. But overall, we reduced our anxiety about the topic by having a positive interfaith experience. So in conclusion, this project gathered a, a group of interested shareholders in online interfaith dialogue because they wanted to move the needle. And starting to get past the seemingly impermeable, impermeable boundaries that keep us in silos. Measurements from the project so mark changes in comfort with ethno-religiously diverse others, recognition of one's own biases. Um, as a cohesive group, we uncovered shared values but also explored very different opinions about morals and beliefs. We tackled such, such topics as racist speech and white privilege found in our nuclear families. We recalled reaching out to strangers on subways, estranged family members, and even the homeless. Survey questions like, I sometimes get influenced by acts of terror and violence. They cause me to change my mind about how much I can trust other religiously diverse others. Were answered more positively by five out of seven stakeholders. Almost as many expanded their insight on the effects of religious or philosophical upbringing. 
this seems to indicate that the group members as they recall their childhood influences developed a new understanding of their rituals and practices i heard many say i never really thought about how that influenced me before this project so interfaith dialogue has become increasingly popular but this project strove to deeply engage a group in an online environment environment which is a little bit still a little bit uncharted territory we also explore the influences of not only faith traditions but philosophical teachings as a way to include the nuns or those who who don't identify with any religious tradition. Over the course of nine months, through dialoguing and journaling, the group explored and came to better recognize the effects of stereotypes, cultural assumptions, and negative, positive as well, in fact, impacts of childhood religious and philosophical teachings. By creating a cohesive group dynamic where participants felt safe and free to express their viewpoints and biases, we were able to go beyond having nice conversations this seems an essential quality to the work that lies ahead, and I hope that people could take a cue from this project, this life project. So the, the last page is um, a, another quote. When we other another group, we point out their perceived weaknesses to make ourselves look stronger or better. And that is actually the homepage of, of the um, e-portfolio that, that, I, that I created for the, for the project, and you can't see it, but there is a, a place where you can go, a WordPress um, site where you can go and read more about the project. Thank you.